Hey man, good morning everyone. So glad to see you. Welcome to everyone watching online. Did you have a good week? Praise God. It's good to see each and every one of you here and pray. I pray you are COVID free. You are Delta variant free. We curse COVID and cannot live, dwell, or function in the city of Colorado Springs or the county of El Paso County. Uh, We got to fight for our city. All right, don't just be like, well, it is what it is. Your prayers have great and wonderful results and make a huge difference. Um, Before we jump into uh, uh, our sermon today, I want to just bait you that if you have an interest, uh, you say, man, I've really just had a, just a really a heart for ministry and and, and maybe it's, maybe it's uh, not career ministry, but maybe it's part-time ministry. Or, or you know what? I really just want to step out of the shadows. And, and I would love, I might have my tent-making business as Paul did, but I really want to lead in ministry. And I, I, want to, I want to do that. We are starting a school of ministry here in a couple of weeks. I encourage you to go online and check that out. And myself... And our staff are going to be unpacking what we do, how we do it, why we do it, leadership principles, vision principles, understanding the call, understanding what God is asking you to do. So I would encourage you to check that out. It is a, a minimal tuition because you're going to get food, you're going to get books, and, uh, and then... And then uh, It'll just be a great opportunity. It's going to happen on Monday nights. What is the date that it starts? The 23rd, Monday, August 23rd. And so I need you to apply for that. All right. We are in the storyteller. This is a, a, I just love in this series because anytime we can go back and say, what can we learn from what Jesus said and what Jesus did? is valuable to me. And today's parable is called the prophet and lost parable. You say, well, I haven't, heard of, I haven't heard of that parable. Well, it's often referred to as the parable of the talents. That's the, that's the 2,000 year ago version parable title. Today's version is the prophet and lost parable. But what you have to understand is, is a lot of people, when, when we read this or try and learn this, we go to our natural understanding of what a talent is today, that I have a talent for tap dancing. I have a talent for singing. I won't, I won't hurt you, <laughs> of which I don't have. But we, we tend to think that it's a talent, that it's a gift or an ability that someone has. Nada. Nada. A talent was the equivalent of 6,000 denarii. A denarii, and I might not be pronouncing right, was one day's wage. And so a talent that Jesus is referring to is a very large sum of money. So I like to keep it practical into today's culture. So if we take today's state of Colorado minimum wage... Uh, Denari equals one day's wage. So at $12.32 times eight hours is $98.56 per, per day times 6,000 days is going to give us an understanding of what one talent, two talent, and five talents is. That comes out to, ladies and gentlemen, one talent equals $591,360. Can we just call it 600 k Two talents equals $1.182 million. Let's just call it 1.2. And five talents is $2.956 million. And Jesus says, if you've been faithful over little, little, he's saying $3 million is little. And someone's like, oh, God is able to do far and above all that we can think, dream, or imagine. We need to expand our thinking is the first thing I see when we we get into this parable. We've we've been thinking, oh, half a million, a million, three million dollars, that's a lot of money. God says, that's where I warm you up at. I want you to be a steward over great things, over much. I want you to be a steward and accomplish great and amazing, mighty things in this world. Okay, with those numbers in mind, let's dive into Matthew chapter 25. Are you ready? Here we go. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated 
What is a parable? Helping us understand a spiritual truth based upon a natural illustration or story can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. <clears throat> he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. They said that a talent, this is the, the uh, New Living Translation, they're saying bag of silver. They're saying that a talent weighed approximately 80 pounds. So you're talking the, the guy with, with five, five times eight is, what's that? 400, thank you. <laughs> Mental block. 400 pounds, come and get your reward. Um, dividing it in proportion to their abilities, he then left on his trip. Now what Jesus, we're going to understand is Jesus is the owner, the master the businessman that is entrusting to his servants, me, you, he's entrusting us with his most valuable, most precious gifts. He's entrusting us with the mission, with the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to go and make disciples. What price can you put on somebody missing hell and going to heaven? Is that worth a million dollars? Is that worth three million dollars? If you could, in the Catholic scheme of life, I'm not trying to put them down, but in the history of the Catholic Church, you could buy your relatives, you could, you could, you could give offerings to buy your relatives into heaven. Now, there's no scriptural basis for it. It's a great fundraising thing, I'm just going to tell you. Just going to the heart of people and saying, yes, Uncle Toby, we can get him in, but he was really bad, so it's going to cost you. It's a great fundraising program, but I can't say that it's truly scriptural because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Not through a pain, a priest off, but through Jesus, okay? Dividing in proportion to their abilities. Now, we're not talking that a talent isn't the ability. On point number one this morning, here's the way I would put it. The talent represents opportunities to use our abilities to serve Christ. This parable deals with our service in the world with what Jesus has given to us while he is away. And we are born with various abilities, but Christ gives us opportunities to use those abilities, to exercise our abilities. And what I would say, this story, this story of the talents, the story of this profit and loss is about responsibility with what God has given to us. And to put things in perspective, point number two, the servants and the money all belong to the owner. You see, we can get kind of caught up in, it's mine, it's mine. But when we understand that the servants, they could not claim themselves nor their possessions as their own. They are employees of the master. The master has said, here is my money. You go and do and work and go and invest it. And it's the same for us today. All that we have, we touched on this last week. And if you missed last Sunday, I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to tell you, it's not, it's not a peachy, rosy message. I'm just going to tell you it's a rubber band message because it's going to stretch you and it's, it's going to pull on you. But as we talked about last week, and, and it's there in your notes, we are owners of nothing but stewards of everything. Because when I come into a covenant with God, that, that I submit and I yield all that I am, all that I have, my, my relationships, my finances, my possessions, everything that I have, I submit to God. But in understanding a blood covenant, all that I have goes to him and all that he has belongs to me. 
And it's, it's an exchange. It's, it's a coming together. And so I can't claim anything as my own, but what God is challenging us is we're owners of nothing, but he has made us stewards of 600,000, of 1.2 million, of 3 million. He's made us stewards of letting our neighbors know that there is a heaven and a hell and that there is a price to pay. But the Bible says that we have been, been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in our actions. Glorify God in our life. And the key is this. When you understand servanthood, what does this servant and these three servants know in this story? All of their needs are met. Their food bill is covered. They have a place to stay. All of their needs are met and supplied, and the owner is saying, now take my money and go invest it and see what you can do with it. And what does our Bible teach us? Philippians 4, 19, my God will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. That God is our provider and that he gives those things to us so we don't need to be distracted about, well, what about me, God? I need a little bit. We say, my God's got this. He'll take care of my needs. I'm a vessel to be used to invest what he has given and invested into me. Now it says in verse 15, he divided it according to their abilities. Point number three, God equips us to accomplish the task he has given us. Jesus gives us the opportunities that match our abilities. If I could put it this way, he's not going to ask you to do something that he hasn't already equipped you to do. God will never ask us to do more than we already have on the inside of this. And so here's the confidence. When we sense, when we feel God's leading, God's push, God's direction... When God says, go share Jesus Christ with your neighbor. When God says, I want you to go and I want you to invest this in that person's life. If God is leading us, then he already knows we're going to give this amount of money away. And he sees in advance what our bills are. And he says, If I'm leading you to give it, to sow it, to invest it, to help and to serve, yes, I know your week is busy, but I'm asking you to serve next Sunday. I'm asking you to give some time to sow into some children's lives. He's going to redeem the time. He's going to send people to help you. He's As we invest, he's going to make a difference. In 1995, I was approached about becoming the youth pastor at Rama Bible Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They're running four and 500 teenagers. Most I'd ever had was about 150 teenagers. But more than that, they were wanting me to come and to teach youth ministry in the Bible school. Now, I, I know youth ministry at that time. I'd been doing it about 14, 15 years. I know what it takes to build a youth ministry. I know what it takes to minister to teenagers. But every demon in hell bombarded my brain with, you've never done that. You're going to fail. Who are you to teach? Why are you qualified? Who are you? Nobody knows your name. What's your name? Nobody knows your name. I don't even know your name. Who are you? Why are you qualified to teach other people how to be a youth pastor? And the little voices started to tell me, and, and, and the opportunity was in front of me, and, 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 and fear started to grip me. What if I fail? What if I can't do this? What happens? Know this. If God has called us to do it, he has equipped us to accomplish it. And I arrived that that spring of of 95, and I began to write because the the curriculum they had for youth ministry sucked. And then I said, I'm not teaching that. And so I rewrote seven classes 
seven classes I would write and I was writing and teaching it the next day and, and, and I had seven classes for a full year, had nine total classes, plus I've got a youth, past, youth ministry of about 500 teenagers, no junior high youth pastor, no assistant, but I had a bunch of Bible college volunteers. And I'm going to tell you what, what I didn't see in myself, God saw in me. And if God's calling you, challenging you, leading you to do something, you need to know and understand that he equips you. And here's what I hear the Spirit of God saying. I shared this with the staff last Monday. You are better than you give yourself credit. You're smarter than you realize. And you can accomplish more than you believe you can. You're better than you realize. You're better than you give yourself credit for. You can do more than than what you feel like you can. We need to walk in confidence. What does Hebrews tell us? Hebrews teaches us in in chapter 13, verse 20, now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. Look at verse 21. May he equip you with all you need for doing accomplishing, fulfilling his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Now let's get back to our story. Verse 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. He's now up to $15 million, folks. He took his $3 million and has multiplied, invested, and he's up to $15 million. The servant with, with 1.2 million bags of silver also went to work, W-O-R-K, work. I, asked, I was at a restaurant least recently, I said, can I just ask, can I just ask why, why is this line so long just to order a taco? And the manager looked at me and said very humbly, I can't get people to work. I can't get people to work. You want the blessings and the favor of God? God, It's first service. Get off your butt. You say, well, I can't. Watch, here is the big. I'm just going to go there. Here is the biggest thing. Why would I go take a minimum wage job when it won't meet my needs anyway? That's someone who doesn't believe in God, doesn't know their God, and has zero faith in God. Because God says, until you put the seed, until you put your life into the ground, I can't produce something if the seed is sitting on the shelf. Or sitting on the sofa. But when we invest our life, then God can produce something through us. God can multiply our efforts. But the servant who received the one bag, $600,000 worth, dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. We'll get to him in a moment. But what we need to realize from this passage is, number four, God multiplies our investments. God is saying, if you will just, if you will just let me work, if you'll just do something, I can multiply my favor, my blessings, my goodness will be upon it. These guys doubled. They multiplied. They, they multiplied. And so we have to understand that when we give God room, God does great things because throughout Scripture, God is known as the God of multiplication. From the creation of the world, he looked at Adam and said, be fruitful and multiply. There you go. Genesis chapter 16 He told Abraham, he said, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that there will be too many to count. The widow's oil in 1 Kings chapter 4, she began to pour it. She said, okay, I'm going to pour it. I'm going to give some away. And she began to pour and to pour and to pour and to pour. It was multiplied. 5,000 people. 
Another time, 4,000 people have gathered to hear Jesus teach. They don't have any food. There's no fast food restaurants nearby. They get a few loaves, a few fish, and they divide it, and they begin to give it. And when did it multiply? When Jesus said, Lord, I thank you for it, and then whoom, here was a 50-foot smorgasbord. It says, as they started to give it away, it multiplied. When we give our life away, when we invest our time, our talents, our resources, our abilities, when we invest them, now we've given God something to bless. God times zero is zero. But God times one gift, one ability, one amount of time, he can begin to multiply that in our lives. Malachi 3.10, or as known as the Italian prophet Malachi Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heavens of army, if you will give 10%, sow it, invest it, plan it. This sounds like multiplication to me. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour. I will pour. Not sprinkle you. Not just give you a little sip. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. This sounds like multiplication. Press down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back in Acts chapter 12 but the hope of God's kingdom kept spreading and multiplying everywhere Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 he said yes and I assure you that everyone who has given up a house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with persecution. And in the whole world to come, that person will have eternal life. That sounds like multiplication. Robert Schuller is known for this phenomenal statement. He said, anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the number of apples in a seed. Whew. You're that seed. What can God produce in us and through us? Because the enemy comes and says, why invest time in that, in that organization? Why invest time in going and helping at your kid's school? Why invest time in your kids? Why invest money here? Why invest money there? Why sacrifice? Why read this book? Why, why go and get that extra degree? Because when you sow, when you give, when you help, when you bless, when you aid, when you benefit others, it'll come back to you and God will take what you have sown and he'll multiply it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6 says this, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. What has the master given to you? Now, let's go to verse 19. After a long time, the master returned from his trip, and he called them to give an account of how they had used his, his money. Point number five, we must all face a day of judgment where we will give an account of our actions. That day is coming. You see, for those of us who our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, it's not a judgment of you're in or you're out. Our names in the book, we're in. But judgment comes, as it's talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where where all of our works on earth will build up either wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. And judgment is the fire that comes, and what remains is our reward for all of eternity. Now, I've got some dump truck loads of wood, hay, and stubble of stupid things I've said and stupid things I've done, but I'm working really hard to plant and to sow and to invest my life to benefit others, so I'm building up gold and silver and precious stones, and that my reward will come from that. Now, let's go on to verse 20. 
It says, the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. He has doubled what the Lord has given to him. Verse 21. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful, here it is, handling this small amount, $3 million. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver, came forward, said, Master, you gave me the two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. He has doubled once again. Then the master replies, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And here is the biggie of this parable, point number six. Our faithfulness today causes promotion, blessings, and rewards tomorrow. You won't see the rewards instantly. You won't see it immediately. But when we give ourselves away, just know it's going to have a big result and big return in our lives. Once God sees you can handle responsibility, it is his desire to entrust you with more. For 40 years, Moses showed himself faithful leading all of Jethro's flocks and sheep and herds and cattle. And God said, I'm going to move you from from being a shepherd of of sheep and cattle, and I'm going to move you to being a shepherd of about three million people that I'm going to have you lead them out of Egypt. David was faithful to protect a lamb, one lamb, from a bear. He was faithful to protect one lamb from the lion. And God said, because I see what he did in secret, I see how he protected, I see his investment, I see he was willing to risk it, I'm going to have him protect my people. He will be the king that defends the children of Israel. I'm a pastor of thousands today, but for 23 years, I was a pastor of teenagers, of 100 teenagers, of 50 teenagers, of a couple hundred teenagers. Why am I where I am today? Because when nobody knew me, hey, buddy, how are you? Have fun. Can I just set the record straight? I'm going to look in the camera and tell everyone here and everyone there. Kids are always welcome at Rock Family Church. Sharon, raise your hand. I get to pick on you. Sharon's one of our amazing worship team members. She shared so excited last Sunday. She shared this story. For the last two and a half years, she's been in a job she disliked. I might even use the word hated. And what made it challenging is the group of people she worked with. She talked about how they would cuss and swear, and, and they were just a challenging group of people, and, 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 and the job and the work. And, and, and it would have been easy after two months and identifying, oh boy, oh boy, I'm quitting. For two and a half years, she sowed, she invested, she planted, and she gave her life to that workplace. And a week ago, hmm, a friend was retiring from his position. And who did he just happen to call but Sharon? And said, Sharon, I think you would be a great fit for this position. And by the way, You told me once what you are making. This would be just shy of a 20% increase of where you have been. So watch this. Your faithfulness, your faithfulness to stay steady, to sow and plant and invest, even when it's hard to plow, even when the circumstances aren't pretty, your faithfulness 
opens the door for God's blessings and God's reward. You've heard of John Joel Osteen. You've heard of his father, John Osteen. Joel Osteen worked on the production team for 17 years, producing, directing his dad's television program. And when his father passed, he had zero preaching experience, zero Bible college, but today he pastors a church that reaches on any given weekend over 50,000 people. Why? Because he showed himself faithful for 17 years. He showed himself faithful when nobody saw him, nobody knew his name, nobody did anything. So you need to learn to be faithful driving Uber and DoorDash. It's, it's a way of income. It's not what you want to grow up and be. But maybe while you're driving, God will give you an Uber idea of 10 years ago. And you'll have your own company 10 years from now. Be faithful. Be faithful in what God has called you to do. Because here's the result found in the book of Psalms, chapter 75. It says, This I know, the favor that brings promotion and power doesn't come from anywhere on earth, for no one exalts a person but God, the true judge of all. He alone determines where favor rests. He anoints one for greatness and brings another down to his knees. You say, well, who would he bring down to his knees? We'll get to the guy with one parable, one talent in a moment. But I want to share this. I, I, I found this story this past week, and it blew me away. In the 1840s, John Getty left the pastorate. He was a Canadian pastor, and he left the pastorate, took his wife and two small children to the South Seas, uh, to a South Sea island, and began a missionary work there among headhunting tribes. 20 British sailors had been killed before he arrives. He has no support. There is no written or known language. He's trying to learn the language. He's in threat of, of being killed on a daily basis. There's, he's, he's trying to connect with the people. And finally, he gets his first few converts. He continued his work for many years. He then translated the Bible completely into this native tribe's language. And Getty labored with little help, with a lot of blood and sweat. But today, still on the pulpit of the church Getty pastored, is this statement. When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. And when he left in 1872, there were no heathen. Whoa. Whoa. Invest your life. There are two ways that the enemy attacks us. One of the ways he attacks us is he attacks us and he says, get jealous. Why, why didn't we get two? Why didn't you get five? It's based upon your ability. If you want five, then show yourself faithful in two, and the Lord will promote you. Why did I only get one? We can't be distracted by what other people have. We have to be focused on what God has given to us. It's a tactic of the enemy to try and thwart us from accomplishing what God has set in front of us to do. The other thing that happens is we become discontent. We, we get distracted and discontent. Would have been easy for Sharon to say, God, I don't like my job. I don't like my job. I don't like my job. She could have gone in, been nasty, been mean. She could have cussed like a sailor, like the rest of them. You didn't, did you? No, no, okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> she, could, she could have lowered herself to their standard. But you know what I believe? The people that she worked with, they're going to notice something different about her office where she just left. They're going to notice, whoa, the atmosphere changed. In fact, it's gotten even more vulgar. It's gotten even more negative. It's gotten even more corrupt because she was a light in the middle of the darkness. But her faithfulness led it to God to promote her and to bless her. Many people here, you've not advanced because to the place that God desires, because you haven't been faithful where you are. It's so easy to be, but tomorrow, 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 I can't wait until tomorrow comes. Live out today. I worked one job four years beyond what I think I was supposed to be there. 
Four years. Four years that wasn't easy. But I know that it was in my investing of my life, my time, my energy, my talents, and my resources that opened the door for God's blessings and God's favor. 90% of church plants fail. 90% of new churches planted fail. I am grateful for God's goodness and favor and blessings upon this house, upon this church, and upon the seeds that I planted, but then you guys start planting, and others came and start planting, and as we plant and as we invest more, we're going to reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. So the reality is, let's go back to our story, Matthew chapter 25, verse, go to verse 24. Verse 24 says, then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose. Can I just pause there? I was afraid I would lose. I was afraid I would lose. I was afraid I'd lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. What gift has God given to you that you haven't sown, planted, or invested? Verse 26, but the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. Why did he hide the money? I mean, it's pretty foolish. I, I wouldn't take $600,000. I just wouldn't feel comfortable. I wouldn't feel safe. I would, somebody would see there's a freshly dug hole, what was buried there. I don't know. I just wouldn't feel safe taking $600, putting it in coffee cans, and burying it in a hole in my backyard. But why did he hide it? He hid it so he didn't have to look at it. He didn't have to feel accountable. I don't want to feel guilty for what I'm not doing, so I'm just going to hide it so I don't have to see it. It's not challenging me. It's not calling me. And some of you, I say this by the Spirit of God, some of you have talents that you have buried. Some of you have gifts and abilities and opportunities that you have buried, and God says, go dig them up. Go dig them up, and there's still time for you to plant them. There's still time for you to invest them, and I will reward you, and I will bless you, says God. Amen? Amen. We need to live and abide and trust the Most High. Look what he says. He said, I knew you to be a harsh man. The other servants didn't say that. What was he doing? Making excuses. Says you were wicked, and lazy. Do you know what? What we know, it does, it does not say anything about his lifestyle except he was lazy and Jesus tied that with wicked. It's called the sin of doing nothing. I'm not doing anything. I didn't do anything, Lord. I didn't do anything. Sometimes doing nothing is as bad as doing something wrong to see a person in need and not help, to see an opportunity where you can serve and go, no, I'm too good for that. Let's invest our lives. Our last point, if we don't use it, we lose it. If you don't use what God has given to you, he'll take it away from you and he'll give it to somebody else. Let's wrap it up. Verse 29 says this, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. Everybody say abundance. But from those who do nothing, even with what little they have, will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Will you stand to your feet with me? I want you to close your eyes. 
I want you to do a, a, just a micro fast soul search and say, God, where have I been holding back? Where, what have you given to me that I haven't invested, I haven't planted, I haven't used, but maybe I've held back and I didn't bury it in the ground, but I put it in the closet of my heart. Maybe some of you have a singing ability and the enemy has convinced you you're not good enough. Brad will help you sort that out. And if you're not good enough, we'll, we'll give you some coaching to maybe get you there. Maybe the Lord's been challenging you to do something here in this church. To move from being a spectator to a participator. Instead of just coming to church to watch, come to church to give. To give and receive. Father, search our hearts. God, we just avail ourselves to you. That we want to be used for your glory. For your honor. And God, you have given us the most precious, priceless gift, the gift of life through Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that none of us would hide that gift, but that we would freely share it with all we come in contact with, and that all men, all women would know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. What could God do through you? Invest your life. Be faithful with what you have and watch what he can do. Before we go, I want to make sure that every person here has a born-again personal relationship with Almighty God. Last week, we talked about counting the cost that Jesus sacrificed all that he had for us. And then when we come to Christ, it's us yielding, and we literally come and we submit and yield and humble ourselves to him to become his servant, but greater than that, to become his son and to become his daughter. If you're ready to take that step of faith, Maybe last week you said, I'm not, and I do need to count the cost. And you say, today I am ready. Today I'm going to take that step of faith. I'm going to count to three, just as a point of contact. Just We've been watching the Olympics, and, and maybe I should get that a little Olympic, boop, you know, runner's ready, boop, and then everyone's like, yes. But I'm going to count to three today. I want you to get ready. And if you say yes to Jesus, yes, I want to follow you, God. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Someone will come and pray with you right where you stand. We're going to cheer. We're going to celebrate for you. Let's go for it. Are you ready? One, two, three. Raise that hand really, really high. Anybody in this place? Anybody in this place? There's one back over here. Praise God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else saying yes to God? Yes to Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the service. If you live here in Colorado Springs or you're going to be in the city, I hope that you'll come and experience the service firsthand. And for those of you that are enjoying the ministry and you're being fed to on a weekly basis, I invite you to partner with us financially and make an investment into the mission and the vision of Rock Family Church. And lastly, if you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you make that decision today? Why wait till tomorrow? Why wait till next weekend? I dare you to pray this prayer with me. Would you close your eyes? Would you pray this prayer with me and repeat it? It goes like this. Pray this with me. Say, dear God, forgive me of all of my sins and mistakes. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I invite him to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. My life is now in your hands. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Amen. Hey, thanks for making that commitment.
commitment. Will you email us at info at rockfamilychurch.com. Tell us about your new decision to stand up big and live strong for Jesus Christ. We'd love to celebrate with you. God bless you guys. We'll see you next weekend.